Welcome. I'm Dr. John Iskander. Um, on behalf of CDC, I'd like to welcome you to Public Health Grand Rounds for February 2016. Continuing education credits for Public Health Grand Rounds are available for physicians, nurses, pharmacists, health educators, and other health professionals. Please see more on the Grand Rounds website. Uh, our speaker disclosure for this session is noted here. Grand Rounds is available on all of your favorite web and social media sites. We are also live tweeting today. Use hashtag CDC Grand Rounds. Here's a preview of upcoming Grand Rounds sessions. Please join us live or on the web at your convenience. I'd also like to thank today's featured speakers and the many people listed on this slide who helped to make this session possible. We have a featured video segment on YouTube and our website called Beyond the Data, which is posted shortly after the session. This month's segment features my interview with Dr. Anthony Komarov. We also have partnered with CDC Public Health Library and Information Center to feature scientific articles relevant to this session. The full listing is available at the Science Clips website. It's now my pleasure to introduce CDC's Associate Director for Science, Dr. Harold Jaffe. Thank you, John, and thank to my, the speakers for coming and all of you for being here. Chronic fatigue syndrome is an important public health problem. I think that's the one message we're going to get across today. And although many questions about the syndrome remain to be answered, we know that the disease is real and that affected patients suffer greatly. Furthermore, the economic impact of the disease is felt across the country. Chronic fatigue syndrome is a biologically based illness that affects individuals in near, nearly all aspects of their lives, significantly affecting their ability to work and support their families. Sadly, studies show that many patients experience significant barriers in terms of receiving appropriate health care. This needs to change. We need to enable health care providers to better recognize and offer better treatments for this condition. Today we'll learn that while there's currently no cure, there are management and therapeutic advances that can help patients and their families. We do need biomarkers to make the disease more clearly diagnosable, but you'll hear some about those collaborations and studies that are underway with the goal of improving our diagnostic abilities and our treatments. But in the meantime, dedicated scientists, clinicians, and patients are helping us incrementally build our knowledge base about the disease. We're aware that just the name chronic fatigue syndrome is imperfect in many ways and can be unhelpful to clinicians and patients. However, we should not let legitimate and heartfelt disagreements about the nomenclature impede our scientific progress. CDC's public health approach to re reducing CFF morbidity includes working partnerships with clinical research experts, patient advocacy groups, and other governmental agencies. At a time of unprecedented attention to this profoundly disturbing condition, CDC is committed to the broad outreach and clinical education efforts. That's just, the session is just one part. And again, the message is CDC is in this for the long run. We're not going away. We encourage our viewers to use and widely share today's information. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jaffe. Our first speaker is Dr. Charles Lapp. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Iskander. Appreciate the introduction, and uh, I can't tell you how delighted and honored I am to be here. I, thanks to the CDC for inviting me to speak today. I uh, can't wait to tell you about chronic fatigue syndrome. So uh, let me start by saying that in 1991, one of my colleagues, David Bell, wrote a book entitled The Disease of a Thousand Names, and that title sort of exemplifies the sort of confusion we've had about this illness. The signs and the symptoms are so general and diverse that chronic fatigue syndrome mimics many other disorders. 
and has earned numerous monikers over the years, including Royal Free Disease, Iceland Disease, Tapa Nui Flu, the Yuppie Flu. By the way, that came from the eminent medical journal, um, Rolling Stone Magazine. <laughs> it's also been called myalgic encephalopathy, chronic fatigue immune dysfunction syndrome, and more recently, SEID or SAID, which stands for Systemic Exertion Intolerance Disease. For this presentation, however, we'll be using the more common name, Chronic Fatigue Syndrome, which was chosen because 100% of the study subjects experienced an unusually severe and persistent type of fatigue. Now, there's no explanation why individuals contract Chronic Fatigue Syndrome, but we do know that the majority of cases occur acutely over hours to days and typically follow a bacterial or viral-like illness. So let me introduce you to a typical clinical case, and this is an actual case from my practice. Jane was a 37-year-old internet technologist for a community bank. She'd been physically active in sports and working out and had been maintaining her own household when she contracted a flu-like illness in 2011. She was bedbound at first and very slow to recover. Within days, she noticed an unusual fatigue after minimal activities, then insomnia, then achiness in the joints, and generalized muscle pain and weakness. She soon found it difficult to recall recent conversations and events. Reading concentration was limited, and she had trouble comprehending what she had read or even TV shows that she had watched. She would search for words, lose her train of thought, and friends would sometimes have to finish sentences for her. Sleep had always been good, but now she was restless at night and she would awaken unrefreshed even after many hours of bed rest. She felt stiff and sore and foggy and for an hour or two after the awakening, she noticed dizziness or lightheadedness on getting up quickly. And on a couple of occasions, she saw stars, uh, but no tunnel vision, no syncope. Now she was unable to keep up the house and she had to rely on friends and family to help her with the cleaning, the laundry, and the shopping. She would attempt to keep up at home and at work, but exertion would inevitably make the symptoms worse. And if she exerted too much, she would end up sick and chair bound for one or two days afterward. Evaluation by her primary care physician revealed rather low blood pressure, but there was no immediate orthostatic blood pressure drop, and otherwise the examination was unremarkable. Blood work was unremarkable. Having no explanation for her symptoms, despite the profound reduction in her physical abilities, Jane became anxious about her future and frustrated and discouraged as well. So our clinical case demonstrates all the key features of chronic fatigue syndrome, exertion intolerance and that debilitating fatigue, post-exertion relapse and malaise, a new onset of sleep problems, cognitive difficulties, orthostatic intolerance, uh, symptoms that wax and wane, and these whole body uh, flu-like myalgias or arthralgias or widespread body pain. Now, the cause of exertion intolerance, pain, sleep disruption, cognitive dysfunction, and other CFS symptoms is unknown, but there is an identifiable trigger in a majority of the cases that we see. A large majority of patients report a precipitating factor hours to days before their symptoms begin. The largest category is preceding infections, although a variety of other medical and surgical events can occur before the onset of chronic fatigue syndrome. CFS is triggered by viral or bacterial infection in about 75% of the cases that we see, and non-infectious causes such as trauma, surgery or childbirth, allergic reaction, stress or emotional trauma, uh, occur in much smaller numbers. There's some evidence that high levels of concurrent stress may contribute to the precipitation of chronic fatigue syndrome. Now, the typical course is a roller coaster ride of flares alternating with relative improvements. While overexertion, sleep deprivation, and emotional stress are well known to trigger the flares, many relapses occur spontaneously and they last for an indefinite period of time. The unpredictable onset and the severity of such relapses make it difficult for a person with CFS to plan ahead or to function on a regular, predictable, or sustained basis. Clinical management contributes to some functional improvement, 
but total recovery is uncommon, and most adults do not return to their pre-illness level of function. Now, individuals with chronic fatigue syndrome are also more likely than the general population to suffer comorbidities such as fibromyalgia, irritable bowel and bladder, Sjogren's syndrome, joint hyperextensibility, or Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, and several other medical conditions. Sadly, however, it's an invisible illness. And to the casual observer, patients appear entirely normal and healthy, but the gravity of the disease is such that it totally changes one lifestyle and, and the lives around that patient as well. One of my patients pointed out to me, and I make this a quote, this illness can take away everything, your dignity, your livelihood, your family, your marriage, and even all of your money. So as you can imagine, the symptoms of chronic fatigue syndrome overlap with many disorders, including depression, MS, systemic lupus, endocrine disorders, hepatitis, and many other illnesses. So in order to confirm a diagnosis of chronic fatigue syndrome, one needs to exclude disorders that could plausibly explain the exertion intolerance and the other symptoms. The essentials of evaluation include, as you see here, a thorough medical history, a thorough psychosocial history, such as a history of dysfunctional childhood, prior verbal or physical abuse, substance abuse, complete physical examination, a mental health examination, uh, perhaps using validated screens, such as the hospital anxiety and depression scale, or the patient health questionnaire, the PHQ-8. Such an evaluation typically takes about 30 to 60 minutes in my office. Lastly, it's recommended to obtain basic screening laboratory tests. They may include a CBC with a white blood cell differential, blood chemistry such as the comprehensive metabolic panel, thyroid functioning tests such as the TSH and especially the free T4, a sedimentation rate and or a CRP, which of course are markers of uh, inflammation, and a routine urinalysis. Now sometimes additional lab work is obtained, if clinically indicated of course, to rule out other possible causes of fatigue such as infection, autoimmune disorders, endocrine or hormonal problems, celiac disease, etc. The results of such testing is usually unremarkable, but it does help out rule out those other conditions that could plausibly explain the fatigue and the other symptoms. Dr. Komaroff will soon be describing the Institute of Medicine recommendations, but suffice it to say at this point that the IOM recommends making the diagnosis actively. Uh, and that means it's important to make the diagnosis promptly, even before one excludes other plausible causes. So the Institute of Medicine criteria for systemic exertion intolerance disease, or SAID, provides a brief and simple method for diagnosing CFS. But many clinicians, including myself, corroborate the diagnosis with established instruments such as the FACUDA criteria of 1994 or the Canadian consensus criteria. Making a diagnosis promptly reduces anxiety and uncertainty for the patient and reduces medical costs because numerous exclusionary lab studies and procedures would not be needed. So let's consider the prognosis for these patients. In a systemic review of the natural course of CFS, a median of 39.5% of adults with CFS improved and a median of 5% experienced complete recovery. The likelihood of recovery decreases with baseline illness of severity, the duration of the illness, and the presence of comorbid psychiatric conditions. Children and adolescents fare somewhat better with one paper reporting 60% recovery at five years and 88% at 12 years after the onset of their illness. In another longitudinal study of 25 adolescents with CFS compared to 25 healthy controls, 80% of the patients had remitted over a course of 25 years, but many still reported more impairment than the controls. Now the management of chronic fatigue syndrome can be briefly summed up by these four pillars, if you will. Education, behavioral change, medication and non-medication based treatments. 
First, reliable education material should be provided to the patients, and an excellent source is online uh, at the CDC website, cdc.gov forward slash CFS. Behavioral modification has been effective to limit depression, anxiety, and abnormal coping mechanisms such as denial and escape avoidance. Pharmacologically, sleep disruption and pain are usually addressed first uh, and may require consultation with a sleep specialist or a pain management group. We generally avoid narcotic pain medications, but helpful therapies include tricyclics, such as amitriptyline and cyclobenzaprine, the NSRI, such as duloxetine and milnasopran, and anti-epileptic medications like pregabalin. The next step in management is to address severe symptoms and to address those comorbidities that the patients suffer. Non-pharmacological therapy might include Epsom soaks, hot and cold packs, liniments, massage, osteopathic manipulation, acupuncture, and the like. Another form of non-pharmacological therapy is staying active but not too active. We recommend starting with very low levels of activity and proceeding slowly. Brief intervals of activity should be followed by adequate rest in order to avoid a flare of symptoms or to avoid the post-exertional malaise. Consider beginning with active stretching and range of motion exercises against gravity, then follow with light resistance training with light weights, for example, or elastic bands. We then advance to certain types of aerobic activities such as Tai Chi, yoga, walking, bicycling, or aqua therapy. To avoid flares, patients should limit activity by time, say less than five minutes per day to start, uh, and limit the number of repetitions. And if they experience any excessive fatigue, reduce the amount of time or the number of repetitions. So the summary from the clinical aspect is that we can um, find chronic fatigue syndrome present in both pediatric and adult groups. It typically has a preceding medical event, often infection. Patients benefit from earlier comprehensive evaluation and diagnosis. The disease can have severe impact on quality of life, but improvement and recovery are certainly possible. And there's no curative therapy, but graded exercise and some types of pharmacotherapy can be of great benefit. Thank you very much, and I now relinquish the podium to Dr. Beth Unger, who is going to discuss the public health approach to chronic fatigue syndrome. Thank you very much. Uh, when designing a public health approach to illness, one of the first steps is to understand the epidemiology of the condition. For CFS, answering this question is difficult because there's no simple test to make the diagnosis, and findings will differ depending on how the patients are identified. For example, self-report compared with clinical assessment, as well as where the study is conducted, for example, in clinics compared with the population as a whole. Population-based studies that include clinical assessments are generally considered to give the most accurate estimates, but these are complex and expensive. Extrapolating estimates from the three U.S. population-based surveys to the country as a whole, we can estimate that at least one million Americans suffer from CFS. Most patients identified in the population surveys have been ill longer than five years, and only about half of those affected continue to seek medical care. In addition, only about 20% of those identified as CFS have been actually diagnosed by a physician. This emphasizes the need for more physician education about this illness. These studies indicate that CFS is three to four more times common in women than in men. Persons of all race and ethnic backgrounds are affected, and there's a disproportionate burden of CFS in minority and socioeconomically disadvantaged groups. The highest prevalence of illness is in 40 to 50 year olds, but the age range is broad and includes children and adolescents. It's important to understand the economic impact of the illness and barriers to healthcare utilization. Patients, their families, and society all bear significant costs associated with CFS. These include direct medical costs of provider visits and medications, and indirect costs of lost productivity. In the US, the estimated annual direct medical cost is between $9 and $14 billion, and nearly one quarter of these expenses are paid directly by the patient and their family. 
the estimated annual cost of lost productivity is between nine and $37 billion. When CFS occurs before age 25, the ability of patients to complete their education is significantly impaired. Inability to achieve their full education potential can have a lifelong impact on earning potential. CFS patients face significant barriers to receiving appropriate health care. A population-based study in Georgia found that 55% of persons with CFS reported at least one barrier to health care. Finances prevented 10% from seeking care. This is twofold higher than the population average found in the 2005 National Health Interview Survey. While the cause or causes of CFS are not known, studies have identified some factors that are associated with the illness. Risk factors may suggest avenues to explore to discover causes or to develop interventions. Infections have been linked to CFS because patients often report an acute onset after a flu-like illness that does not go away. And some patients have a history of frequent infections prior to their illness. Epide epidemiologic studies do not support association with any single pathogen. Post-infectious fatigue, that is failure to recover from a documented infection, occurs in about 10% of patients with a variety of viral and non-viral pathogens, such as Epstein-Barr virus, Ross River virus, Q fever, that is Coxiella burnetti, or Giardia. The severity of the acute infection is most predictive of subsequent illness, and there's no evidence of an unusual persistent of infections in those who remain ill. Compared to healthy controls, persons with CFS have had exposure to significantly more stressors and are more likely to have a higher allostatic load. That is a measure of the physiologic consequences of chronic neuroendocrine response to stress. They are also more likely to have metabolic syndrome. These associations are unlikely to be specific to CFS as stress is a factor in many chronic illnesses. Twin and family studies support the contribution of both genetic and environmental factors in CFS. No specific genes have been identified, and a polygenetic explanation for increased susceptibility is most likely. CDC recently shifted its focus from population-based surveys to studying CFS patients being cared for by clinicians with specialized expertise in CFS. Population-based surveys are helpful to identify the full spectrum of those affected and include a broad range of illness severity. Patients identified from clinics tend to have more severe illness. Most studies of CFS have been conducted in patients enrolled from single clinics and include small numbers of patients. Many intriguing findings have not been replicated, leading to the suggestion that heterogeneity of patients may contribute to this difficulty. Our study is designed to document a comprehensive picture of CFS patients identified in multiple clinics and to describe the approach that experts use to diagnose and manage their patients. We use standardized questionnaires to measure the major domains or characteristics of the illness. These questionnaires measure the level of function, pain, fatigue, type and severity of symptoms, and sleep. We also collected medical history, family history, physical examination results, medications, and results of laboratory tests. We included the PROMISE instruments that were designed and validated by NIH to measure symptoms experienced in many different illnesses to allow comparison between illnesses. The SF36 measures of function and multidimension fatigue inventory have also been widely used in a variety of conditions. Seven clinical sites have participated in this study, which was initiated in 2011. Five participate under the umbrella organization of the Open Medicine Institute Consortium. The clinicians participating are all well-known, ex respected experts in CFS and include one of our speakers today, Dr. Lapp. Their expertise is what gives credibility to the study. We are very grateful to their patients who have agreed to be part of this study and have accepted the additional burden of completing the many questionnaires required. We collected complete data on 471 patients in the baseline study. These were distributed fairly evenly across the clinics. The mean patient age was 48.2 years and the mean duration of illness was 14.3 years. Most patients were female and the vast majority were white. 
the mean BMI was 26.6. More than three-fourths of the patient had a college education, and nearly all were insured. While about three-fourths were unemployed, only 14% were receiving unemployment benefits. There were uh, statistical differences in the, the demographics between all the clinics in these measures, except the proportion not working. The patients in these specialty clinics may not be representative of CFS patients in other healthcare settings, as they were all highly educated and with sufficient socioeconomic support to be able to navigate their way to these specialized centers. Most patients had been seen and evaluated by more than one physician prior to coming to th their clinic. We found significant heterogeneity in the patients overall, but there were very few differences between clinics in, the, in these average measures. This is illustrated here for functional status as measured by the eight subscales of the well-validated instrument SF36. The box plot shows the full range of values. The top and bottom of the box is the 75th and 25th percentile. The bar in the middle is the median, and the small diamond is the mean. While you can see there is significant heterogeneity in these measures overall, there's no significant difference between the clinics. In this scale, higher scores indicate better functioning. If we compare um, these values to healthy controls, the red bars indicate the mean of the 213 healthy controls we enrolled. And these values compare well with other studies. The important feature to note is that the patients so show significant functional impairment, particularly for vitality and physical functioning. But there is relative preservation of mental health and role emotional. The data in our study confirms the seriousness of this illness and the extent of impairment experienced by patients with CFS. We are continuing this study to collect longitudinal measures of illness characteristics and to enroll groups of patients that have been understudied, specifically pediatrics, severely ill or homebound patients, and patients within two years of onset of Ill illness. We are also enrolling healthy controls and ill comparison groups who may present similar, similarly to CFS. In addition, we are collecting blood and saliva on those enrolled so that they can be tested for biomarkers that have shown promise in smaller studies. Results from this study will help to find patient subgroups that reflect different causes or that could suggest targeted therapies. Finally, the data clearly show that the patients in these specialty clinics are highly educated with significant financial and social support that enable them to reach these experts' physicians. Again, this emphasizes the need for dissemination of knowledge about CFS to the broader medical community. It is clear that despite decades of work, CFS remains a challenge for clinicians. Patients have difficulty finding compassionate and appropriate care. Physicians and other healthcare workers need evidence-based information about CFS. CDC has responded to this need by developing a series of continuing medical education courses. In 2012 and 2013, we partnered with Medscape to present two roundtable discussions that were targeted to primary care physicians. These reach more than 22,000 physicians and more than 6,000 continuing medical education credits were issued. Currently, CDC has two free online courses available on the CFS website. These are accredited for both physicians, nurses, and other healthcare professionals. However, CFS is rarely covered in medical schools, and this leaves a vacuum of knowledge. So we've begun the process of developing standardized patient videos accompanied by educational curriculum for the MedEd portal. This is a free online service provided by the Association of American Medical Colleges. The materials are peer reviewed and once approved are made available to medical school faculty free of charge. Finally, CDC is continuing communication with the general public and adv advocacy community. An important part of this has been the introduction of patient-centered outreach and communication calls, PCOCA calls. These are one-hour teleconferences that are available toll-free in the U.S. They began in 2012 and are generally held twice a year. The format is that CDC uses the first 10 minutes to give an update on current activities of the CFS program, and then an outside expert or group of experts presents information on a topic of interest to the community. 
These talks generally last 35 to 40 minutes and are followed by answers to questions submitted to the PCOCA email. Topics have included identifying patients for clinical studies, exercise, infection and immunity in CFS, CFS and cognitive function, sleep research in CFS, Stanford's research program, and self-management strategies in CFS. We are grateful to all the experts who graciously gave up their time to share their insights with the patients and their families. Most recently, we've begun a new initiative to include broad stakeholder collaboration into developing educational materials, including the viewpoints of patients, medical professional organizations, medical educators, educational organizations, expert clinicians, and government agencies will help assure the quality and usefulness of these products and help facilitate broader dissemination in the medical community at large. Our first focus will be modification of the CDC CFS webpage to incorporate recommendations of the Institute of Medicine. And I'd now like to turn the podium over to Dr. Komarov, who will talk to us about the, those initiatives. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Unger, and thanks to the CDC for organizing this session today. I was asked to speak about three recent authoritative reports that, um, in which experts, many of them from outside the field of chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, evaluated the evidence that's been published. The three authoritative reports, the first is from the Institute of Medicine of the National Academies of Science, uh, which issued a 300-page report in which the panel uh, reviewed a literature of nearly 9,000 published uh, articles and concluded that MECFS, which is the name that I'll, I will use, uh, is a biologically-based illness, as Dr. Jaffe said, and proposed a new case definition as well as a new name. The second report uh, was from the NIH, which held a Pathways to Prevention conference with a follow-up report, drawing similar conclusions about the biology of MECFS. And then finally, the Federal Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality commissioned an independent review that focused on diagnosis and treatment. The Institute of Medicine report first addressed the question of the scope and the seriousness of MECFS, drawing heavily, I might say, on published studies from CDC. Consistent with Dr. Unger's summary, the Institute concluded that between 800,000 and 2.5 million Americans have the illness. The Institute also agreed with Dr. Unger's summary that the costs of the illness to society were substantial, as much as $51 billion annually. Based on their review, the Institute panel concluded that, quotes, MECFS is a serious, chronic, systemic disease that often can profoundly affect the lives of patients and that MECFS is not, as many clinicians believe, a psychological disorder. Then the Institute of Medicine panel turned to an important and obvious question, one that probably has been asked by every clinician and investigator involved with MECFS, which is, given that MECFS is defined exclusively by subjective symptoms, symptoms that any human being can say they have, are there any confirmatory underlying objective biological abnormalities in these patients compared to healthy subjects and compared to patients with other fatiguing illnesses? And that includes comparison with the biological abnormalities reported in some psychiatric illnesses. The Institute of Medicine found considerable evidence of underlying neurological abnormalities as reflected by many different diagnostic technologies, 
Those singled out for special mention by the panel included slowed information processing, problems with white matter integrity, neuroinflammation, impairment of working memory, hypothalamic pituitary axis abnormalities, and autonomic abnormalities. The NIH report was in general agreement with the Institute uh, on this issue. The Institute of Medicine also concluded uh, that there were considerable immunologic abnormalities in patients with ME-CFS. They highlighted two as being particularly well substantiated. Impaired natural killer cell function that correlated with illness severity and increased cytokine levels in blood uh, suggesting a state of chronic immune activation. As was stated by Dr. Lapp and Dr. Unger, the Institute of Medicine noted that many, but not all, patients with ME-CFS report that their illness began following an acute infectious-like illness characterized by fever, myalgias, respiratory, GI, neurologic symptoms, along with severe fatigue, an illness from which the patients say they feel they have never recovered. Indeed, the medical literature includes many reports of post-infectious fatigue syndromes linked to well-documented acute infections. For this reason, many have wondered if at least some cases of CFS may be initiated or even perpetuated by infection. The Institute panel concluded that there is, quote, sufficient evidence suggesting that uh, MECFS follows infection with Epstein-Barr virus and possibly other specific infections, viral, bacterial, and possibly protozoal. NIH report concurred in this and called specifically for research on the possible role of herpes viruses in MECFS. There have been several case definitions proposed for this illness. Perhaps the most widely used is the case definition developed under the leadership of CDC and published in 1994. The Institute of Medicine panel proposed a new case definition that it hoped would be simpler and shorter, easier to apply consistently across patients, likely to result in fewer false negative and false positive classifications, and likely to be a better predictor both of response to therapy as well as prognosis. The key elements of the proposed new case definition by the Institute are first post-exertional malaise, defined as a prolonged worsening of a patient's baseline symptoms after physical or cognitive or orthostatic challenge, exertion or stress. The second component, unrefreshing sleep, that is defined as regularly, like every morning, feeling unrefreshed after sleeping many hours and apparently sleeping soundly. Third, cognitive impairments of a wide variety of types that are made worse by exertion, effort, stress, or time pressure. And then finally, orthostatic intolerance, symptoms that worsen upon assuming and maintaining an erect posture and that are improved, if not completely eliminated, uh, by lying back down or elevating the feet. The complete language of the proposed case definition is shown in this slide. I'm not going to read it all in the interests of time. Uh, you can go through it. It's, um, it's shorter than prior case definitions. It's less complicated in some respects, um, but it's still not simple. But at the moment, I think it may be about the best we can do. The new case definition, like most that preceded it, does not include laboratory studies. MECFS remains a multi-system disease for which we do not yet have a single diagnostic biomarker. Indeed, until there is a gold standard pathological finding for the illness, 
I don't think it will be possible to test the accuracy of any case definition, not the false negative or the false positive rate, because there'll be no gold standard against which to test it. It will, however, be possible to compare the performance of different alternative case definitions against each other in large numbers of patients, and that already uh, is underway. And as pointed out by the Agency for Healthcare uh, Research and Quality, a new case definition like this one does need to be tested empirically uh, to verify that it is superior to its predecessors. The name chronic fatigue syndrome was first coined in 1988 by a group convened by CDC. Uh, as a member of that group, uh, I would note that we were all focused really on developing a case definition. No one really thought about the name. And when someone pr proposed the name chronic fatigue syndrome, sort of people said, why not? That was a big mistake. Uh, many of the patients and clinicians believe that that name, chronic fatigue syndrome, trivializes and stigmatizes this often devastating illness, and I certainly agree. Many different names have been proposed, as Dr. Lapp summarized. The new name proposed by the Institute of Medicine, Systemic Exertional Intolerance Disease, um, has some merits. It focuses on a core component of the illness, but I think it's too early to determine whether this new name is going to be widely adopted uh, by both the clinician and patient community. In summary, the Institute of Medicine and the NIH reports conclude that patients with ME-CFS have an underlying objective biological abnormalities, that their symptoms are not imaginary. However, none of these biological abnormalities is so sensitive and specific that it constitutes a biomarker, a, a diagnostic test. MECFS is an important disease causing great suffering to many individuals and their families and billions of dollars in lost productivity to society. Finally, more research is urgently needed and indeed the NIH uh, along with CDC, has recently announced its intention to expand its focus on this illness, particularly in its intramural program, as described next by Dr. Avi Nath. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me to speak at the CDC uh, Grand Rounds. And, um, it's a pleasure to talk about our planned study at the uh, National Institutes of Health. So, uh, so as, uh, as some of you know, the uh, National Institutes of Health has had a long-standing interest in chronic fatigue syndrome. In December of uh, 2014, NIH sponsored a Pathways to a Prevention workshop to advance research on MECFS. In September 2015, uh, Dr. Francis Collins, who is the director of uh, NIH, uh, tasked the intramural program to develop a research protocol to study the illness using the unique resources that are available uh, at the intramural program. Um, the relationship of infections to the onset of ME-CFS and the uh, large body of literature identifying a variety of interesting but inconsistent immune abnormalities uh, in these patients provide a rationale for further studies of immune regulation. Uh, for example, two studies from a group in Norway uh, showed delayed clinical improvement uh, in patients following treatment with rituximab, which is a monoclonal antibody that depletes B cells. However, these studies were small, and the immune profiles were not measured uh, in these patients. Um, so uh, as we've heard, uh, patients uh, with ME chronic fatigue syndrome uh, can be associated with a variety of precipitating factors. Um, our studies will be focused on a, a defined subset of patients uh, who have a viral illness at onset uh, of their illness. And uh, uh, these patients are likely to have quite similar immune profiles. 
our hypothesis is um, that post-infectious MECFS is triggered by a viral illness that results in immune-mediated brain dysfunction. And to address this, we have proposed a three-phase uh, study. Uh, the first phase is a cross-sectional study, which will define the phenotype and the pathophysiology of the disease. Phase two will validate the biomarkers in a longitudinal study. And phase three will be an early phase intervention trial to target the biomarkers identified in phase two. So for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to focus on phase one. And uh, the first aim of this study is to define the clinical phenotype in using in-depth assessments of all domains of the illness as listed here. Aim two of this study is to define the physiological basis of fatigue using functional MRI scan of the brain to define the brain circuits that are involved. Uh, do detailed metabolic studies in a metabolic chamber um, and do transcranial magnetic stimulation as well as very detailed autonomic testing. Each of these tests will be performed before and after uh, exercise. The third aim of this study is to conduct a detailed immunological uh, study in blood as well as cerebrospinal fluid including a screen for autoantibodies to neural antigens. Uh, we will also fully explore the gut and oral microbiome and apply proteomics and metabolomics approaches to the cerebrospinal fluid. The fourth aim of this study uh, will utilize a variety of novel approaches to explore whether cells or serum from patients can be used to experimentally reproduce some of the features of the illness. We will determine if there's an inherent metabolic abnormality in neurons derived from stem cells and culture from these patients, and if exposure of spinal fluid will induce the functional abnormalities in these cells. We will also generate humanized mice using blood cells from patients and determine if the clinical phenotype can be reproduced in these animals. If these experimental systems are able to reproduce the clinical or biological abnormalities seen in these patients, it would be a major step towards identifying the cause and the pathophysiology of the illness and for developing a variety of treatment approaches to these patients. So uh, for the purpose of our phase one study, we plan to recruit patients primarily from well-characterized cohorts uh, particularly the CDC's um, MCAM study described earlier by Dr. Unger. Uh, selection criteria will include documentation of the acute onset and duration of fatiguing illness for more than six months but less than five years. All patients will have post-exertional malaise and full criteria of the 1994 research case definition and the uh, Canadian consensus criteria as mentioned earlier. The study population will include 40 post-infectious ME CFS patients, 20 healthy controls, 20 post-Lyme disease uh, patients who are asymptomatic, uh, that means they do not have fatigue, and 20 patients with functional movement disorders. Uh, these studies are still being refined and rely on the talent and expertise of a large number of investigators listed here. I would uh, like to particularly thank Dr. Brian Wallach, who is uh, the lead clinical investigator of this study at NIH, and Drs. Unger and Lipkin as members of the executive committee for the valuable advice. The intramural program at NIH is uh, looking forward to the new insights that will come from the concerted research into this illness. We expect that synergy between the CDC's work, NIH's intramural studies, and researchers worldwide will allow therapies to be identified. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. We do have time for some questions. I would ask everybody to keep their questions brief so that we have time for our experts to answer them. And first, Susan, do you have some? Yeah, 
pressure to bear on researchers and educating treating physicians to use far more extensive and detailed survey instruments and be far more precise in their description of the symptom presentation and pathogenesis. Okay. Um, I, I think that we are publicizing the importance of using instruments to uh, precisely characterize the illness. And uh, we are in the process of publishing the baseline results of the MCAN study, which will absolutely special, uh, specify the instruments that we're using and how, how they can help in other studies. And I believe the, the, and we've been working with NIH, and we're going to be sharing a lot of the same instruments and approaches. Yeah, uh, I agree. So um, we are delighted to be able to share whatever information we have and to work very closely with the CDC, as Dr. Anger mentioned, uh, to achieve those goals. There are two um, microphones on either side. If you do have a question, you need to use the microphone because this is being recorded. Susan? Uh, another of our viewers would like to know all the specific steps that are being taken to educate medical students in medical schools using the latest information from the 2015 Institute of Medicine MECFS report. <laughs> okay. Um, well, we are. We have just started our uh, medical student uh, curriculum, as I mentioned, through the MedEd portal. Um, this incorporates, uh, so we started it before the 2015, but the educational um, curriculum that goes along with it gives the references for the IOM, um, uh, the IOM report, thank you. Um, uh, in addition, we have our collaborative process on ongoing, um, or it's just being started, where we are trying to work with medical educators to find out what kind of materials they want and can easily incorporate into their classes. The advantage of the MedEd portal is that it is online and um, it is uh, free for faculty and actually uh, medical students actually can have access to it independently as well. So we think that'll be a useful start. And the work group. Yeah, the work, that was, I, yeah, the collaborative work group um, is what we hope will also be uh, giving us advice as to what will be most helpful. Yes. Dr. Ness, could I ask you to be a little more detailed about the Patient Advisory Committee, how you intend to incorporate patient input into the NIH study? And could I also ask, I don't know if you would have the answer to this, about external funding from NIH to other researchers on the outside, possibly through RFAs that might be developed? Excellent question. I'm delighted to try to address both of them. So firstly, I think uh, input from the patients is absolutely critical for any disease that you want to study. They are the ones who really experience the symptoms and live, it, uh, live with it from day to day. So uh, as physicians, whatever input we can get from patients is very important through whatever mechanism it is. Uh, any physician will tell you that you learn a lot more from talking to patients than you do from reading any kind of textbook, journal, or whatever uh, medical literature that is available. So careful listening to patients is absolutely critical. So with that in mind, uh, you know, I grew up in the uh, early AIDS epidemic, and I saw uh, interactive with ACTS UP and, um, and other um, uh, patient um, forums whereby they had a great impact on the way disease was handled, treated, and moved the federal government to make changes at every level. And so uh, we understand the importance of it, and there are uh, efforts underway to put that advisory group together. Um, so, um, uh, you know, people who are senior to myself uh, want to look at it uh, from all perspectives and put together a proper group that will address both the intramural, extramural things. So I think those efforts are underway, and we're looking forward to that input. Uh, with regards to extramural funding, that's, again, beyond my <laughs> area of, uh, of authority, and so I know there's a lot of interest in being able to make that happen. A lot of advocacy groups have approached NIH with that effort. I think the heart is in the right place, and all those things will be done. Uh, I think uh, just a, it's probably just a matter of time before you'll see all these things happen. 
but there's no lack of interest in making that, uh, uh, achieving those goals. Uh, thanks, Steve Monroe, uh, Associate Director for Lab Science and Safety. I have a question for, for Dr. Nath. And given the uh, consensus on the role of immune dysregulation in the symptoms of the disease, can you elaborate a little bit on the kinds of uh, functional immune assays that you're um, projecting to do with the upcoming study? Okay, so I have put together a panel of really outstanding immunologists to guide me. Um, although I do consider myself a neuroimmunologist, there are people who ask, and uh, every immunologist is not the same. So, yeah, people who specialize in T cells and B cells and NK cells and so on and so forth. So what I did was I called upon Dr. Neil Young, um, who is a uh, expert uh, immunologist at, at NIH, and uh, uh, Ronald Germain, who is a National Academy Science member. And so uh, and we sat and discussed various kinds of things. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to collect a lot of lymphocytes, both from blood and from CSF. Initially, we'll be storing them. And what we'll be doing is looking at cell-free fluid in the CSF and the uh, serum for not just a small number of, of cytokines, actually 1,500 lysates, uh, analytes, OK? So but we want to be a very, very comprehensive. And, and I've developed a proteomics uh, assay in my own lab, which will look at about at least 2,500 proteins. Okay. So when we look at those, that composite, I think it will be very clear to us that what cell types may be dysfunctional in these patients and how we can subgroup those individuals. And that will then allow us to go back and now say, okay, well, this looks like an NK cell function. Let's look at it. Or this looks like a B cell function. Because there's just numerable amounts of very time-consuming, tedious assays for each cell type that you could potentially do or interaction between cell types. So instead of doing that at the get-go on everything you can possibly think, I think that's a good screening tool. And then we can focus on the real aspects that we think are really dysfunctional. Do you think primary care providers can offer appropriate services to chronic fatigue patients, or would it be better for them to refer to specialists? Well, I would, I guess Dr. Lapp and I can both. Yes, I think primary care providers can provide adequate uh, services, particularly if they have people in ID, neurology, backups, when something doesn't add up. But primary care providers need to be better educated than most are currently. I would agree with that. And as a primary provider myself, uh, and a former family physician and internist and, and pediatrician, uh, we're at the forefront. The, the family physicians, the family doctors are the ones who really see the majority of these cases first. Uh, not the specialists. And, and so, uh, as Tony has pointed out, it's very important for these providers um, to be educated and know how to recognize the patients when they walk in the door. Uh, and I should point out, we, we found uh, from previous studies done by the CDC that not only uh, the primary providers, but also the mid-level providers are doing a lot of the diagnosing and, and initial treatment of patients too. So I think it's very important to address that group of individuals. While I have the microphone, I, I would like to say that uh, since the IOM report came out and the P2P report, uh, um, that we've seen a great deal of movement from the government. The patients always want to hear that, that there is something being done. And, and from my perspective, working with this wonderful group, I've seen a lot of movement on uh, behalf of the CDC and the National Institute of Health and, and even uh, you know, some positive statements from uh, Dr. Francis Collins, who seems to be supporting a movement uh, for more research into chronic fatigue syndrome. So I hope that's good news to the patients. It is good news. Thank you. I'm Brenda Robertson. I'm a nurse at Emory & Grady. My background is community health and divinity. And I want to know if there's, anyone at, is, if there's anyone at the CDC or NIH or beyond looking at research in environmental triggers such as the chemical loads that have been added to the food industry since the 70s and 80s, like phosphates, fructose, citric acid. And I wondered if anyone's um, looking at it as serious triggers because this is a widespread illness. Uh, we don't have a specific focus on that. We are aware that there are um, environmental triggers in some patients, but 
it is something that we have in mind, but we don't have an active uh, program in that right now. Um, at the intramural program, we really don't have that kind of expertise. Our focus will really be on immune dysfunction, but the samples will certainly be stored. So I think once the extramural community gets involved that have expertise in those areas, uh, we'll be delighted to work with them and provide them whatever uh, resources we have in sample, patient samples. I'd like to uh, ask for a hand for our uh, panel of speakers one more time. Thank you very much, and uh, please join us next month for Public Health Grand Rounds.